the notes. notes. Yeah, that's that. Oh, you want to do? I don't have any notes in there, though. Oh, you don't? Okay. Well, that's fine. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Joe Arnold. My name is John Dickinson. I uh, work at SwiftStack, and I'm the project technical lead for OpenStack Swift. And I'm, uh, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, SwiftStack. And we're here to talk about a new project that's in OpenStack Swift, where we're going to be introducing it to OpenStack Swift, called ProxyFS. And what ProxyFS is, is an integrated file system access natively built into OpenStack Swift. And the design goals are to support both object and file for the same data for the same workflow. And this, of course, is going to be part of the uh, OpenStack ecosystem. It's, it's open source. Um, and we're going to be diving into uh, the details of what it looks like and talk about some of the use cases um, that we're hearing about and we're looking to support. So the great thing about Swift and the reason that this is really great is we're building on top of Swift itself itself, which has a thriving and growing ecosystem and community. So over the last several years, well, since before OpenStack started, Swift has been deployed in production at massive scale all over the world. We've seen dozens of companies join in. We've seen hundreds of contributors offer code and review into the project itself. And all of the graphs are going up and to the right. And so over the last few years, some of the things that we've been able to be a part of and see that is uh, building out things like global clusters and storage policies and erasure codes. We're currently working on encryption within the project. And we see that this is something else happening in the ecosystem that's really just at least, if not bigger, a bigger deal than all yeah, of those. And, like, and then recently, like in the ecosystem, then there's S3 API support, which has been greatly enhanced um, over the, the past few months. And this is just another extension of things that we can integrate directly into the open source project uh, to, to meet more workloads. Um, and so just to, uh, just to come from a perspective of, of where, co where we're coming from, SwiftStack, um, we are a commercial uh, object storage provider. And we provide, um, we're, not, we're the leading contributor to OpenStack Swift. John's the project technical lead. And then what we ship with our product is, is the core uh, Swift project. So it's unmodified. And then what we add then is we do things like underneath Swift to do hardware monitoring and managing the underlying hardware infrastructure. Above that, say, we'll do monitoring how much data is being used, so you can do chargeback, integrate into authentication environments. Um, and then what we've done is we've created a control plane, which we call the Swift Stack Controller, so that it makes it easier for people to deploy, operate uh, a, a mul uh, multiple regions, multiple zones of, of their infrastructure. And it's really more about providing operations at scale um, and completing what people need to, uh, to run Swift. And but we've had a number of conversations with customers. And one of the things that they need in order to do more with Swift, they want the, the architecture, the everything John talked about, about with object storage. They want the architecture. They want the scale. But they still have existing applications. They still have existing tools. So they're doing data generation. And they're shooting, like with the video, we're moving to 4K, you're moving to longer episodic episodes, and you need a ton of data online. Medical imaging, uh, genome sequencing, these are petabytes upon petabytes of, of data workflow. And then you have end users. And then end users have, we're putting lots of data into the system, but the, if the only way for them to get access to it is via an object API, that doesn't necessarily fit with the workflow, with the software, with the tools that they're using. And uh, so file is a way people are, are accessing it and an existing applications and workflows are generating it. But you have the volume increasing. So traditional file systems are starting to meet some scale limitations that, 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 that they're experiencing. And then you have a group of developers who want to be building applications using an object API. Um, you talk to any developer nowadays that's coming up, they're, they're very much more willing to consume an S3 or a Swift API because it's, it's a REST API. It's much easier to do. So there are much more developer features around that. And so you have applications being built. And so there's this conundrum that, that, that needs to be solved is how do we use existing things that are generating data, yet supporting the new applications that uh, people are wanting to build. OK, so if applications are going to be using and developers are going to be writing stuff in Object API, 
Why are we spending time working on what the, the old and busted, the old, the old file system access? Okay, yeah, John is teasing like an analogy I've been using out of me, right? Which is like, okay, let's say the future is all gonna be driving cars, or self-driving self cars, right? And so then do we not bother to get a driver's license? No, that would be like, that's, that, that's silly, right? Um, so this is a way for us to support both of these needs at the same time. So the first time I heard about ProxyFS and the first time that you want, the first thing you want to do when you say, I'm gonna provide file system access onto something, that's really great, use a gateway. There's a bunch of them out there. Just pick one and use them. But the thing is about gateways is that they are built with a fundamental design that the storage that you're making this gateway to is remote. It's someplace else. And so even if it's not particularly deployed that way in every instance, the way the actual software and the functionality that a gateway provides is built is built with that assumption. And so when you do that, when you build something with that assumption, you have to make certain choices. And that's like, I need to spool some data locally. So I need to have a little bit of storage locally in my gateway. And I need to, I can't trust this, uh, this network link because it's, less trustworthy than something that might be in the same data center because these things are high latency, low throughput links because it could be even going to a different continent or at least um, mm -hmm. something that's uh, a couple of time zones away. But if we, I mean, when we're, st we're starting down the design process here, um, the guys that were like, we p really went to the, to the drawing board again, they're like, well, wait a minute, like, we're doing private deployments, right? I'm like, yeah, we're doing private deployments. Well, why do we, are we, are we making this assumption that the storage is somewhere remote? Why don't we take advantage of the storage that we have the object storage itself and build on top of that as an architecture rather than assuming that we only can access, you know, via the public APIs, we have to come up with some caching mechanisms. Let's, let's not do that at all. Let's use the object storage as the persistence layer for the op that we have to architect this. And so the summary is basically that, yes, you can use a gateway and gateways have their place. And we're not saying that you shouldn't use a gateway. What we're saying is that in these kind of private storage deployments, which is where we see OpenStack deployed more and more and more, you can actually take advantage of that because you have a certain special knowledge that you have to assume you don't have with a gateway solution. So that's why something that's tightly integrated is a better solution overall for the end user than something like just using an off-the-shelf gateway. And then you have the, the other kind of flipping this on its head. So why not just have a file system underneath that you deploy and then put file system access on top? Well, then you're, it's like the opposite, right? Then you have basically an object gateway that's talking to a file system. And then you're not really gaining anything at all because you're kind of, it's like the, the Venn diagram of the, of, of the worst of both worlds. You have the restrictions of the object API, you have the scale limitations of the file system, and um, uh, you have to manage and uh, operate that file system, which is the whole reason why people are looking to object storage and the architecture to begin with, is that they want the that object on the, uh, on the bottom for the operational scale. So we can have to build on top of Swift itself to be able to integrate with Swift itself. And there are three primary characteristics about Swift that we can rely upon. The first one is that it's durable storage, which means that if you put data into it, it's there and it's there for good. And more so than that, uh, when you get a successful response back, it means that you're going to be able to, to read that. We, um, we make sure that we are handling a lot of different um, uh, hardware failures, we're working around all of those things transparently. We're making sure that uh, in the background, we're, we're um, just taking care of those normal things that happen in a storage cluster, hardware failures, uh, file system corruption, um, unexpected power cycles, all of those sort of things. So we have a very durable system. And alongside of that, we also make sure that it's highly available, which means that, yes, you can pull the power out of an entire rack and Swift keeps on working. And you can lose servers all the time and Swift keeps on working and works around that transparently. The really great thing is you can put these things together and you get stuff like being able to do rolling upgrades. It's actually rebooting a server to upgrade it ends up doing, being treated in the system just like a server happened to go down momentarily. And that's completely okay in normal operational concerns. So it means that you can expand your cluster. It's great. It means that you can do rolling upgrades. It means you don't have to wake up at 2 a.m. on a Saturday morning because you had a pager duty ticket that said that your hard drive failed. So the third thing that we need um, is this feature of Swift that is read your creates. So 
when you create a new object in Swift, not an overwrite of an exi existing object, but when you create a new object of a, uh, inside of Swift and you get back a successful response, that means that you can read it and it means that anybody else is gonna be real, able to read it too. You can read that create right away. So I put something in, Joe re tries to read it, everything's good. This is the building block for the, the fundamental design of what we're doing. We're gonna go into a lot of detail about how that actually ends up working about the individual components. Of right, CFS. because this capability allows us to build a log structured data format inside of Swift. And this will be, this is a picture of what we're gonna be walking through in the next few minutes here. So there's a new component called proxy FS, which sits aside of the proxy services. And the persistence of that file access is done as objects into the Swift object tier. Um, so that means there's no gateways, um, and then we're gonna be using a log structured data format to persist the data into the system. So, log structured files in Swift. So what do they look like? So it's a segment, a segment of data that comes in, and this is a new way of storing data. What, what you do with that segment is then you need to have a manifest that comes and it runs in the tail of that segment to contain which, what information, uh, what's the map of that, of, of that particular file. And when you add additional segments into the, into the system, those are connected together via those manifests um, into a whole object. So this is actually, if you've been around Swift for a while and you know what's going on, um, this is like the, well, we're not talking about that yet, are we? We'll get to that in a second. Okay. So the segments have uh, byte ranges associated with them. And uh, those byte ranges are, exist inside of those manifests, and uh, those manifests then can point to different ranges, or they can point to um, other manifests. And those manifests form a tree so that you can navigate. So when a file system comes in and does a seek to a certain location, we can uh, efficiently navigate to the segment and the byte range offset that we need in order to get the file that we, that we need to get access to. Right. So then, uh, so then when a new data comes in, so let's say you're um, modifying any, really anywhere in, in the system, adding data at the end or adding data in the beginning or modifying some data, what you're doing is you're adding an additional segment in and then garbage collection comes along and will delete data that uh, is no longer needed, it's no longer part of that manifest map to reclaim the necessary space. Okay, so let me try to sum up that piece right there. Okay. We've got file system access. You do seeks, you do tells, you do writes, and then when you seek to byte position 100 and you try to write a few hundred bytes of data, this is not something that we are seeking to the middle of some object in, in Swift, right? Right. So we are creating a new object inside of Swift. Remember, we have those read your create properties. Then we can update a manifest, which is really just, here's some offsets of where you need to go look. So um, we created an object, uh, we created a file with the file system access. We created this one segment inside of Swift. Now we need to update that. So we create this new segment inside of Swift. Where the manifest says, you're gonna go back to that first one, read this series of bytes, then we're gonna go read this new segment over here, this other series of bytes, then we're gonna go back to the first one and read the, the rest of the series of bytes to be able to get your data out. Or at least that's the basic logical idea of how that's working. Yep. So that read plan, you would go to that manifest, you have a location of where that manifest is, so you can build that read plan, um, so you can read that data for a file system access. And the, the, the other benefit of being able to put this in multiple segments is you get parallel read performance when you're servicing that file request, because it's multiple segments. Again, those segments are just objects in Swift. They can be parallelized out and you're hitting different parts of the system uh, to read, the, read that file as you're, being, uh, as you're serving it. Um, the other benefit of the strategy, and we're seeing this particularly in media workflows, where you're writing, you're starting to stream data in. As you flush, you create additional segments into the object storage system. And that allows a read to begin before the file has been finished writing, uh, compl uh, completed. So you can imagine broadcasting or uh, security footage streams, that's very useful. Um, this also allows for object f access to it as well. So object access is a, is a log structured um, access to, it's a manifest 
managed by Swift, you're going, just going through the, the proxy request. And again, because it's the manifest, you can use the surface area of the whole cluster to surface the, the, the read request. So when somebody tries to access read or write, or specifically in this case read, I mean write, through the object API, and this is an object that has been enabled for bimodal access, at that point, the ProxyFS software will be able to intercept that and read and write it down using this log structured format. And I think, to me, one of the most exciting things about that is that now the file system clients and the object storage clients can coordinate. So in a file system world, you may get a lease on a file and you're doing things and you want to be alerted when you need to refresh your caches and things like that. And then I come in and <laughs> do a put into the system of a file that you say have a lease on. And the next time I try to go read the data, I have been notified already because those access methods are coordinated with one another. So this, this is, yeah. yes, this is what I wanted to talk about because every time we start talking about this, this is what, um, this is what everybody thinks about. It's like we kind of have something like this already in Swift. This is the way we do large objects inside of Swift. We basically have this manifest, which is one little file by itself, one object by itself, which you could think of as a read plan, like we've been saying, and you've got a whole bunch of segments. Now, in this, in a, in this case, we read the static large object, and it says you're going to go read object A, and you're going to go read byte ranges, you know, one megabyte through one gigabyte from that one, then you're going to go to object Q, and then you're going to go to object B, and then you're going to go to whatever. So you, you, you kind of do those sort of things. It is very similar, but there's a couple of important differences. One. The object, the, the manifest file in a large object inside of Swift is kind of this table of contents up front. It says that here it comes. We're going to go read this manifest, and now we're going to be able to know exactly where we go. And just like a table of contents in a book, it kind of comes up front, and it gives you this high-level bullet point of, you know, on page 33 is where chapter 2 starts. The log structured files is kind of the inverse of that. It's more like an index in a book. It comes at the end. It's generally going to be larger. It's going to have reference that, well, we're going to go look for these particular ranges back and all of those other things over there. It's like you know, there's a structure to it. It's alphabetical, right? And we're, similarly, there's going to be a, there's a structure to the way the manifest is representative. Right. And the advantage of this also is that generally that index is going to be much bigger than the table of contents. And by uh, putting this into new objects and uh, keeping that manifest updated every time you're adding these new log structured segments, it means that you can continue to grow that uh, to be quite a number, uh, quite large. So then, okay, what's a file without a file system, right? We need to connect all of these files together in a file system tree. So we have to support a few things, right? So we have to support both file trees and object URLs. And there's multiple layers in the hierarchy as, as you can navigate down that file system tree. You need to be able to move items, right? And, and it tip, it's, it, with a Swift API, you don't, there's no move, uh, there's no uh, rename command implemented, but if you go into a file system and you rename some root directory, you're not expecting data to be moved around, just update, eight, updating pointers to that data. Um, we need to support hard links and sim links. And typically, because of the type of use cases, why people would be bringing Swift into their organization, that tends to be a large, large number of files, so large number of direct files per directory, and that needs to be efficient as well. So the solution is exactly the same as, uh, as the file approach. So instead of a log-structured file, it's a log-structured struct log directory. And that directory segment contains data. So it's a special segment. And we understand that in there is the elements that are part of that directory. So the name of, that it's referring to, and then the inode that it represents. And so those children can be files. They can be directories. And uh, those, the, they're just a log structured file, just like anything else. So likewise, when you're adding new items to a directory, and that you mean like I'm updating the listing. You're updating a listing. I do ls and I see 10 things. Yep. I do ls again and I see 15 things. Correct, because you've okay. added new things in there. So you're adding new things in there and an, an additional segment will go in it, in, uh, be created as a new object inside of Swift and, uh, and then be 
updated, that become, the, the manifest becomes the new root for the, the, the tree that represents the, uh, the manifest, and then a read will happen uh, to get the, get the directory listing. So the advantage of this is that we can do parallel reads in the Swift object storage system to get the contents of the directory, so that can be fan out. Um, and then the other advantage is when we do do an update to a large directory listing, we don't need to do the roll up all the way to a root node. So it's more efficient. And then the log structure directories, right? So now it's kind of piecing these two things together. Each, uh, each file, or sorry, each directory in the system has its own directory segment. And, uh, and there's one for each uh, directory in the hierarchy. And those are all represented as a unique object. So that allows us to translate a path and work through that hierarchy to navigate down a file system tree to represent that file system in the export. Okay. Ah, right. inodes. inodes. This is the thing. So yeah, you know, these are what we've described so far. We've kind of gone real deep into, as if, you, if you're keeping up right now, what we've got is a whole lot of individual objects inside of Swift. We've got to kind of tie these together to some way. We've yeah. got those manifests which tie together individual subsets of these. So you're updating a file via the file system access or the object API access for something that's enabled bimodally, and it will end up creating a bunch of different segments that are then tied together with this manifest. And each one of those segments, of course, I will say it again, unique ID. Unique ID, unique objects inside mm -hmm. of Swift, right. But now let's say, for example, uh, we'll have one that's made up of three segments. We need to kind of tie those together logically. And we're calling that an inode because that's generally what they're called in the file system world. An inode is an indirection layer. In a traditional file system, you buy a hard drive, put a file system on it. The inodes are this mapping that is between the logical file system path name to the actual physical geometry of the drive. In, in general. Or the block device, whatever right. you're Right, the block using. device, it's, it's, the, it's the block address. You've got some more things inside the hard drive, of course. But the point is that you need this indirection layer to say, I want to translate in my documents to you know, go to this LBA and be able to have that mapping. So the inodes are the things that we need to keep up to date. And then when something moves around, we can just update the inode and it's, we don't have to move the actual data itself. And the inode is also a convenient place where we can put other types of metadata. So the link count, modification time, access time, creation date. All the traditional of, things you'll have in the um, file system. So what's also interesting is we can put user-defined metadata in there as well. And so for those who are putting data in the object API and putting user-defined metadata, that can also go into the user-supplied metadata on the file system side as well for the uh, file system clients that are able to consume that. And so that's what gets down to the other major part, the actual what's the magic behind this. So we've got now millions and millions of objects inside of Swift that are this log structured thing. And we've tied them together with the manifest and we have the inode abstraction layer. So now we need to know how do we go find the right manifest to find the right segments to be able to read the data that you asked for. And that's where you have to come in with something else that we've got, an inode mapper. And the basic idea here is it's key value store. It's going to have to be strongly consistent. And this is where you look, do your lookups. So yes, this is a lookup table, essentially, mm -hmm. that is when an object comes in, we can now translate that to the current end of the, where the manifest is located. The last one of that chain of segments is located with this unique object ID. Go look at it. So just like in a local file system where you'll say that I need to go look for my documents and it says go look at this inode, which tells you the block address, go look over there. In here, we're taking the requested object name or file name and look, using the inode mapper to, um, to go look at the Swift object ID, the unique distinct object there. Right. So and that's the mapping. And then that allows atomic updates. So that allows us to create a series of transactions um, that, we, that the file system wants to represent to the system, and then it, it, it interfaces with the inode mapper to go execute that transaction. And so the, the thing that we've done here is that we've isolated what needs to be updated, what needs to be updated transactionally only to the inode root object ID mapper. So it constrains what needs to be part of this uh, transactional update. Um, and then, 
So similarly, John touched on this a, a minute ago, which is you also feed that a file path or an object URI and to translate that between uh, a path so it, to a root object ID. And then that you root object ID, you do look at that up to get, uh, to get that into the system. So there is a, so if you're for for the object API access, you don't necessarily need to re traverse the uh, the file system tree in order to go get at that individual individual file, just like with the object API access. So the target here is is POSIX file system compliance. So to have the hierarchical uh, directory structure, um, symlink uh, information, uh, being able to do atomic path updates, flush. Uh, stat, F stat, truncate, um, but also kind of, uh, it, I think, fairly, pretty, pretty importantly is, is on the permission side. So the goal here is to be able to map the, uh, the, the permissions at the share level with what is provided in Swift. Um, and by connecting those two things and integrating that within to, into SMB, um, that simplifies the, 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 how much management needs to be done for, for the operators. Uh, speaking of which, so our chart, so the, so the, so it, the 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 first implementation is to be exported via SMB, and so we're doing a um, a couple of things here. First is clustered Samba, and uh, doing using above that using DFS for load balancing uh, across that clustered Samba. Then on the back end is using Samba VFS, and Samba VFS is an an an, an API that you you can conform to instead of routing through. Uh, fuse uh, down into user land and all the way back up again. So it's a more direct path into proxy FS. So everything uh, stays in the same, same process. Uh, and then the second thing, so SMB compliance, so there'll be 2.1, 2, 2 um, NTLM for authentication, um, supporting leases, uh, but for byte range locks, uh, because of the workload that we're, we're going for, which is this ingest workload, uh, will will the initial mutation does not ha doesn't have bright range locking. So the second benefit. So okay, did we say again that all these segments are <laughs> objects in Swift? But, okay, if we're do if we're doing that, that means we can take advantage of storage policies. So from a deployment perspective, um, that means we can store those segments in different storage policies. Now most of the deployments that we involve ourselves, uh, you know, we're, we're wrapped up in. Typically, we use a bit of SSD for account and container data. Well, we'll also then use um, a, a solid state media for storing uh, directory segments. So that will um, speed up the latency between, for people who are trying to navigate a file system and doing directory listings. Uh, and also means we can do things with the file segments and store them instead of a replicated policy, maybe for uh, someone who's using this for an archival use case, store it in an erasure coded storage policy. Really, so language. So we're, the proxy FS code is being written in uh, in Go, and uh, we're, uh, the initial open source release will be over the summer. And contact either John or myself um, for for preview or to get involved um, with the project. So overview. All right. So this is file access integrated into OpenStack Swift. The goal here is bimodal access for data within the same workflow. And the, it's really a bridge for these data intensive workloads. So they can continue to be using file system access for the applications, for the tools that they already have, but start to uh, use, to build applications using object APIs. And it's still designed for the same workloads that Swift is already good at, which is the high concurrency, so lots of users, lots of incoming connections coming in, high throughput rates, um, uh, it still has the same durability properties and availability properties. And so that's it. Um, thank you very much, and uh, happy to answer any questions you have. Is the uh, inode mapping database stored as a Swift object and replicated uh, as a standard Swift object? No. It is an external key value store. OK. How is that? Um, so if you have ProxyFS and like Samba VFS running on multiple proxies, how do you, how is that like replicated between them? 
So in that sense, what that is going to have to be is a distributed key value store that okay. has its own consistency processes and um, coordination engine inside of it. Okay. Like, and rather than distributing that out through, as an object into the whole system, we can create a pool of proxy nodes that are just servicing that. So just like we might have a pool of proxy nodes today uh, servicing across, um, like for, it's very typical for us to do a, a, a proxy pool that exists in a region, and then we, there's another region which has its own proxy pool. So each, you're, you're only spreading that, uh, just, uh, that data across that, that smaller set of servers. Good question, though. Big line. Uh, over here. Hopefully I didn't miss this in the very beginning, uh, but is there any interaction between the key value store that stores all the mapping uh, for the inodes and uh, the ring itself? No, not directly. Uh, two quick questions. The first one, uh, what about authentication? How does it integrate with Keystone or stuff like that? So the point is, right now, Keystone is not a file system authentication thing. Um, Swift can perfectly support Keystone and will continue to do so. So one of the advantages, again, of the kind of bimodal access and being able to expose some of these um, file system attributes with the Swift primitives that we already have, accounts, containers, objects, means that we can actually start translating the ACLs that we have in Swift with the SMB permissions that you would have there. Now, that being said, we it's, haven't completely yeah. written that code yet, so how but, should it work? I mean, yeah, these are the things we'll explore. Yeah, and so we, and we, so we, uh, we do have, there's an uh, Active Directory module, which will make it, will we'll make that tie-in easier um, uh, for, for folks that are, that, are, that are working with us, but um, we'll, we'll need to figure out the mapping between what a Keystone user is and um, an SMB user. So Certainly. that being said, I think the last point here is that for the time being, our, our decision right now is the resolution of the bimodal access is at the Swift account layer. So in that sense, you've got the account and account ACLs with container ACLs inside of that that is then going to be wholly exposed as an export. And so that's what the SMB would be able to consume is that account container metadata. We actually have some of the SMB stuff written. Yes. OK. Yeah. And, uh, last question. Um, how does it integrate in an existing cluster where there is no log structured stuff yet? Good or? question. Yeah, good question. So this would be a new, think of it more like along the lines of a storage policy. It won't be implemented with exactly the same mechanism. But yeah, new data coming into the cluster would have to come in through that path and be stored as a log structure. Um, for, for, for the access over, over the, the bimodal, file, access, bimodal yeah. access. Yeah, correct. And, and that being said, it, in, in a lot of ways, you can look at this as a, it's an application data structure. Swift is storing blobs of bytes, and that's what Swift is concerned with. But we've got the proxy FS piece, which can intercept that and say that this is going to be, it's in this sort of structure, so when I start seeing this data stream, I can interpret it in this way. And so it's not something that, um, it's, it's going to be possible to add it to existing clusters, but it's not going to be that, for example, in OVH's cases, my existing 75 petabytes are all now going to be 100% available over file systems. It means that we can enable it for this particular subset. And that's the key that actually makes this thing kind of click for me and work, is that we can look at the workload that people have, look at the actual overall data flow of, I've got to do stage one through 15 of my pipeline, and this set of the data right here needs to be able to access for bimodal access. I mean, yes, there's a lot of complexity here, and that's not a problem per se, but it is something that we have to go into saying that, yeah, we've got to look things up in the key value store, we've got to be able to traverse these uh, log structured files and all those kind of things. Let's not pretend that this is going to be this stunningly performant file system used for high frequency trading. This is something that we want to have the, the workflows that require that both access, or at least we've got a workflow, we put stuff in with object, and then we need to get the same data out with file systems or vice versa, then we can do that and we can enable it for that. Yeah, so you can enable kind of it. Again, it's the, it, you know, it, it does bear repeating. It's the same, it's the same thing that you'd, you would target for object storage API. So it's, it really is the high throughput, high concurrency workloads. Yeah, great. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, how do you expect this, those uh, index structures to scale to potentially billions of files, billions of objects? Yeah, so how do we, so the, yeah, so the. So there's two things. There is two questions. There's two there. things. Yeah. One is that the, uh, the index files, those, that manifest fi part, is only keeping track of the, the segments for that one particular file. 
And there's a couple of strategies that we're doing there that basically we're, we're not looking at, you know, first 100 bytes, second 100 bytes, whatever. We're looking at the actual file system write operations, which can be pooled at whatever size is appropriate for your tuning. And then that's going to be written down as an object, and then we can update that. Um, the actual structure of that is a B plus tree. It's just serialized down there. So we have nice scaling properties about a very wide and shallow tree. Um, and then the second part of that is, yes, there will be billions and billions and billions of objects in Swift. Swift is really good at that. And what we're going to have is the, um, the, the, the that uh, distributed key value inode mapper is the one that's going to have to keep track of where's the head of a particular thing that you're adding in right now. And that's going to be kind of that separate system over here that you're going to separately scale and, and, and then build. Yeah, and then that, the manifest is just going to be the, the new manifest is going to be the root of that B plus tree. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it sounds like you have an inode mapper that needs to point at the actually correct manifest at all times. So you're limited to like your sort of write throughput by how many operations you can push through this new consistent store. Is that accurate? Yes. And is there, there like some expectation about how high that scales? Yeah. So the the the, the expectation. So the, that's a good. That's a really good question because um, the the way we can do that then is we can. I, we don't necessarily need to inherit that same cons constraint across all the object pools. We can create like the, the previous question that was asked. We can create a pool of uh, that is for a particular export that is managing that item mapper, and so. Sure, it's going to be constrained by the distribution and the updates on that pool, but you can create other ones in the system uh, for additional exports as, the, as, as needed. That's Sounds a good cool. question. Thank Thanks. you. So you mentioned several times the bimodal access with yeah. this solution. So in general, as far as I understand, with uh, your kind of layout of the file through to multiple segments, you cannot simply just get single object. You'll have to reconstruct. The, if you want to access the file, as an object, you'll have to reconstruct this content uh, in some, using some kind of external code. Is it correct? Well, from a client point of view, yeah. it, it will, it'll be transparent from, from the object API. So when the read request comes in to the proxy node, it will ask, to create, ask for that read plan, and then that creates the read plan in a sequential order for all of the, all of the segments. Mm -hmm. and uh, then depending on how much buffering we're going to do uh, to, to how parallel we want to do the retrieval, it will, it will ask the object storage tier then for all of the Very segments and stream, and stream it up. So from the client point of view, it's going to be transparent. <clears throat> but you're correct. Yeah, there's, 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 there's a component in there mm -hmm. that will, uh, will understand that it's speaking, it's, it's, it's querying for a log structure object and, and do the reassembly there. All right. Thanks. Instead of, instead of map, doing the request mm -hmm. down to an object server, does the seek for the single file and then and streams it up. Thank you. So thank you. And the last thing I would like to say here is one thing I love to say all the time. And if you've at all seen me speak before, you've heard me say this, which is my vision for Swift is that everyone will use it every day, whether they realize it or not. And we're seeing that happen because we're seeing thousands of deployments and we're seeing that grow. And we're seeing millions of users around the world use Swift every day today. And that's really great. The thing is that we do to take that to the next level is we continue to remove barriers to entry for people using Swift. This is ProxyFS is something that's in the overall OpenStack Swift ecosystem as a way to remove barriers to entry is the way we continue to make sure that everybody uses Swift every day, whether they even realize it or not. So thank you very much. Thank you.